For this final session, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce our final speaker, Professor C.M. Naim, who, as all of you will probably agree, needs no introduction. So I'll spare you a reading of his CV or a listing of his publications. But I do want to say a couple of words. Uh, not only because I'm proud to be a member of what is perhaps the last generation of his Urdu students, but uh, also because he has introduced me uh, to the world of the Ghazal, which uh, sort of like Orpheus I can't turn away from and I keep getting sucked back into it despite my pretensions as a historian. So, <laughs> and also because Naim Saab has always, ever since I got to Chicago, presented we students or us students with a tremendous example as First, as scholars, for instance, I, it was on the wall of his office that I first saw the famous, famous couplet of Urfi Shirazi, which he also has on the wall of his house, but still sits in your office. <laughs> and I've appropriated it as somewhat of a scholarly motto. It goes, Zanakshe tashna labi dan, ba akle khish manaz, dilet farib garaz jalba esarab nakhod. Which could translate roughly as, uh, do not boast about your knowledge. Know that you suffer from a lack of thirst. Your heart is deceived if you refuse to drink from the shimmering surface of the mirage. <laughs> now, whenever I think of this chair, I remember not only seeing it several times a week on the wall of Naimsov's office, but I also hear his voice in my head saying, don't ever forget that you're not as smart as you think, young man. <laughs> 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 but in addition to scholarly inspiration, Naim Saab has also always been for me and for many of the rest of us gradu graduate students a role model not just of intellectual and academic pursuits, but also for demonstrating a paradigm of remaining always engaged in the world beyond academia. In addition to his countless scholarly articles and translations, he has also penned countless opinion pieces, editorials, and essays, all of which engage and challenge his audiences to think through the difficult issues of the day. Now, this colloquium today is on the face of it about history and politics, and about histories of Muslim League politics specifically. But in the months of organizing it, Manan and I have talked at length over coffee and the occasional beer about the pressing relevance of this kind of discussion in today's global political context, for obvious reasons. This, in fact, is one of the primary reasons for the digital archive, which we've discussed at length um, in the last hour or so. But the subject of the Holy Indian Muslim League, indeed of the last century, is not solely about history and politics. It also involves questions of memory. Even Manan's and my generation, to some extent, carries with it a living memory of the nationalist movement, independence, partition, and so on. For us, it is, as Ghalib's famous share put it, one of the first that I learned in my first Urdu Ghazal class with Naim Saab. Yad teen hum ko bhi ranga rang bazma rayan, lekin ab naksho nigare ta ke nusyan ho gayin. Which could translate as, I too have a memory of those colorful assemblies, but now, alas, they are but the etchings on the niche of forgetfulness. Still, I must admit that in my case, these memories, if we may even call them that, often reference what Rushdie so famously called an imaginary homeland. But for Naim Saab, even if some of the memories of that time have been tucked away, they are far from imaginary or secondhand. Thus, it was in the extremely self-serving interest of having the opportunity to listen to his reflections on the intersections of history, politics, and living memory that Manam and I invited Naim Saab to give today's closing remarks. He was gratefully accepted, <coughs> graciously accepted, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce him now. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, indeed, very much. Uh, uh, Sarah, I'm sorry to say I've changed the title. <laughs> uh, yes. And uh, I'll be talking about a place called Barabanki, which uh, the correspondent 
of Life magazine, no less, Mr. Alexander Campbell, visited in 1954 and described that paradise on earth as uh, having a gloomy pall of smoke hung over its mean streets and it is smelled like an oven. So that was Baravanki and uh, also some facts perhaps. In its uh, 1951, the population was uh, of uh, Muslims, uh, urban Muslims was almost the same. Even in 1951, the population of urban Muslims was 39,700 and of urban Hindus, 42,338. So that gives you an idea of the composition of the urban uh, as opposed to and uh, so the, uh, there was a sort of confusion of uh, mixed metaphor. I had put the word uh, act and, you know, play will have act and act will have scene and I had conceived of this thing as scenes really and so I thought the best thing would be to have a sentimental farcical essay in three scenes. Uh, and my essay also has an epigraph. Uh, it comes from the Bard of St. Louis, Missouri, with due apologies and gratitude, uh, which I use to give my ramblings a structure. No, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, an Urdu wala, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, or as in the case here, exactly three. Scene one. In December 1906, 28 men traveled to Dhaka to represent UP at the formation of the All India Muslim League. Two were from Barabanki. One of them, my grand uncle, Raja Noshad Ali Khan of Maila Rai Ganj. 39 years later, during the winter of 1945-46, I could be seen marching up and down the only main road of Barabanki with other kids, waving a Muslim League flag and shouting slogans. No, I don't imply some unbroken trajectory from my granduncle's trip to my strutting in the street, for the elections in 1945 were in fact based on principles that my granduncle reportedly opposed. It was Uncle Farid who first informed me that Noshad Ali Khan had gone to Dhaka. Uncle Farid knew the family lore and enjoyed sharing it with us boys. In an aunt's house, I came across a fading picture. Seated in a dog cart and dressed in western clothes and a jaunty hat, Noshad Ali Khan looked like a slightly rotund and moustached English squire. He had been a poet and one of his couplets was then well known even outside the family. Sadly, I could no longer rem correctly recall it, and so I offer only an improvised version. Dosto baghe jahan mein surat e shab nam rahe, ek hi shab go rahe, lekin gulon mein hum rahe. I lived in the world's garden like a drop of dew, for only a night, but in flower's lap. My grand aunt always said it was a perfect epitaph for her brother. However, posterity in the form of Professor Francis Robinson gives us some more information. Robinson writes, he was a Kidwai Sheikh of the same family as the Talukdar of Jahangirabad, he attended the foundation session of the All India Muslim League at Dhaka in 1906 and was appointed a member of its provisional committee. From 1907 to 1909, he campaigned with Vikarul Mulk and Muhammad Ali for the foundation of district Muslim leagues. He was the first secretary of the UP Provincial Muslim League after its foundation in June 1909. 
In the same year, he agitated against separate electorates and took part in the July 1909 discussions of the Government of India's compromise proposals. He was supported by his uncle, the Raja of Jahangirabad, in 1909 as a candidate for the Aud Muslim seat on the Provincial Legislative Council. This, he was uh, described by Hewitt, who was the Lieutenant Governor of UP, described by Hewitt as a disreputable talukdar. He faded from politics after the Morley Minto reforms. Naushad Ali Khan had, in fact, not faded away. He had merely died, reaching not even an age of 35. And ironically, in the election that Robinson mentions, he had lost to none other than the second Barabanki man at Dhaka, Mr. Muhammad Naseem, the grandfather of Professor Irfan Habib. I may also add that unlike what frequently happened with reference to one of his cousins, there was never an exchange of knowing glances when his name came up in the family. He had married but had no issue. He had lived extravagantly, often giving donations beyond his means to public causes, like the 5,000 rupees to the Mohsen mulk Memorial Fund at Aligarh. And when he died, his estate was sold off to pay his debts. Now that you know the crucial role Barabanki played in the foundation of the Muslim League, allow me to boldly skip forward 39 years to the winter of 1945 when the elections that settled the political fate of South Asia came also to Barabanki. Scene 2. I was 11 years old in the fall of 1945, mildly precocious for my age, and the smallest boy in seventh grade. I was also an enthusiastic member of the All India Muslim Students Federation, which had opened its branch in Barabanki a year or two earlier. It had a fair number of members from the three schools in the city. Of course, it was an all boys. We, we played a prominent role in the processions taken out by the league. We managed the crowd, helped with banners and flags, and lustily led others in raising slogans. We did much the same at our election rallies, except that the smaller boys like me were assigned to help in the curtain section exclusively for women. The big attraction of the MSF for me was its dingy reading room. We didn't get any Urdu newspaper at home. Father read only the Pioneer. But at the MSF, I could read too the weekly Mansoor from Delhi, and the daily Tanvir from Lucknow. The first was the mouthpiece of the Central Muslim League. The UP branch, just for the purpose of the elections, had started the second. The files of the two newspapers now seem to have disappeared in India. Soon after the independence, North Indian Muslims, scared of house searches and arrests, desperately got rid of anything connected with the League and many public libraries did the same for their own reasons. Only last year, finally, did I find a few tattered pages of Manshur, all from May 1944 at the Jamia Millia. I was surprised. I had always remembered it as a fine-looking paper. That apparently wasn't always the case. Despite its two mastheads, one in English, saying supported by Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and the other in Urdu, Murabbi qaid e azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. What I saw was third-rate calligraphy on cheapest paper. Offered at three anas per issue, it couldn't have found many takers in 1944. Obviously, before 1945, Manshur and its Urdu readers had not been of much importance to the Central Muslim League. An editorial dated May 28, 1944, however, didn't surprise me, for it laid out the hostage theory of the League, which I had so often heard, of in, heard in 1946. 
I quote, the Muslim League, it declared, wants that the Muslims in the Muslim majority regions become safe from the influence and domination of the Hindu majority in other regions and that a balance of power should be created. You see, this is very interesting, the first line itself, that the, we have to save Punjabi Muslims from the UP Hindus. Uh, and that a balance of power should be created between the Hindus and Muslims of India by establishing free and autonomous Muslim governments in those regions. Whatever kind of treatment Muslims in Hindu majority regions, regions shall require from the Hindu governments, the Hindus in the Muslim majority areas would require the same from the Muslim governments. And thus, the rights and welfare, hukuk or mafad, the rights and welfare of the Muslims in the Hindu sectors shall be much better protected. It sounds so simple, so logical. Believe you me, it sounded simpler and more logical back then when phrases like territorial adjustments, linking corridors and inseparable heritage sites were the currency of the day. And when the most potent, the most passionately raised cry at our rallies that winter was Pakistan ka matlab kya la ilaha illallah. What does Pakistan mean? There is no God but Allah. It was of course the league's high command that chose the man to represent Barabanki in the legislative assembly. Chaudhuri Khaliqu Zama, at the time the most powerful man in the league in UP, has a revealing story. According to him, the UP branch of the Muslim League set up a board of nine persons to select 66 candidates for the elections. When the board convened, some of its members had candidates of their own for consideration against the candidates already chosen by Khaliq Zama and his coterie. The first case was taken up was for a seat where Maulana Hasrat Mohani, a crotchety, communist, pan-Islamist, romantic, had a different nominee. The presiding officer called for a vote in favor of Mohani's candidate, and only three hands went up. Then, before a vote could be called on the other man, Khaliqu Zama intervened and withdrew out of respect for the Maulana, he says, the name of his choice. Now, the wily Lucknow politician knew the rules of our adab very well. His action, as he quietly puts it, had an overwhelming effect on the board's future decisions, as all the 65 candidates were then selected unanimously. Be that as it may, the young Maulana Jamaluddin Abdul Wahab was the perfect choice for Barabanki. His father, Maulana Abdul Bari of Ferangi Mahal, we called him Bari Mia, had gained national fame as the leader of the Khilafat movement. The famous Ali brothers had once proclaimed him their spiritual mentor. Even Gandhiji had come and stayed at his house in Lucknow. After the abject collapse of the Khilafat movement, the people of Ferangi Mahal had followed many different political paths and Bari Mia's son, not quite out of his twenties in, in 1945, had chosen the leagues. In our Jawar, in that hard to define landscape of kinships and marriages, but also of emotional affinity and cultural oneness that cut across religious and sectarian divides, Bari Mia had been the most revered Sunni figure during his life. Probably no Sunni Muslim elite family in our Jawar was without someone who was Bari Mia's disciple. Murid. My late grandfather must have been one since he had sent my father to study at Frangi Mahal. My grandmother certainly was, though at a second remove. She was a Murid of Qutub Mia, Bari Mia's Khalifa. I had seen Jamal Mia at our house. He called my grandmother Chachi and she in turn didn't observe Parda with him. Of course, all the savants of Ferangi Mahal, though established in Lucknow, belonged in their ancestral origin to Barabanki. They were all considered 
men of our jawar even though they lived in lucknow the resident league leaders in barabanki on the other hand while belonging to the right class were mere lightweights to make sure of my impression i called up an older brother in karachi mateen my brother was at aligarh in 1945 and when the administration of the university encouraged the students to go out and work for the good cause he had gone off first to gorakhpur in eastern up and then to nawabsha in western sindh to work on behalf of the muslim league the experience was no doubt good for his soul but it was a disaster for his education i asked mateen was there much of a muslim league in barabanki before 1945 hardly any he promptly replied then he mentioned the two names that were linked in his mind with the muslim league of those years that assured me that my own recollection was not wrong one man as mateen put it was a nutcase <laughs> though though neither he nor i could recall exactly how as for the other man i can still visualize him a lumbering figure with a prominent head made the more conspicuous by a fur cap that is sometimes decorated with a crescent and a star he was indeed a prominent figure at the league's rallies that winter but then he was no less conspicuous in barabanki for living in a curiously unfinished house that was surrounded by tall reeds and invariably got flooded every year by an insignificant stream mateen and i were also unable to identify the president of the local branch of the league at the time but decided that it, that he too was not much known for anything in contrast several of the muslim elite or the mia log of our jawar who had joined the congress and had made a name for themselves in local and provincial politics the most prominent of course was rafi ahmed qidwai of masauli who was made the revenue minister in the 1937 go- congress government in up and who lo- and who later went on to greater prominence in the central cabinet under nehru rafi ahmed qidwai could have run from barabanki but he chose to put his political reputation to test elsewhere and gave the nod for the barabanki seat to a distant cousin of his jamilu rahman qidwai of badagaon thus it developed that the battle to represent barabanki muslims in the provincial assembly was fought between a jamal and a jamil a rather confusing manifestation of the truth in the prophetic in the prophet's axiom Allahu Jamil wa yuhibbu al-jamal God is beautiful and loves beauty It's fascinating but not surprising that the Congress candidate whom I call Jamil Chacha and most people address simply as Jamil Mia was also educated first at Farangi Mahal and only later at secular institutions As most kidwais of his generation he had joined the congress and identified himself with the faction around Nehru Since 1937 he had been the president of the district congress and twice gone to jail at the party's orders Needless to say he had what counted most in Barabanki the Jawar connections not only was he a kidwai he belonged to a major clan of the kidwais Now don't be surprised if I tell you that while Jamil Mia presided over the Congress party in Barabanki his older brother Ehsanur Rahman Qidwai was the general secretary of the UP Muslim League being also a man of adab Ehsanur Rahman Qidwai didn't actively work against his brother in Barabanki instead he joined Khaliq Zaman's campaign in Lucknow and earned grateful mention in Khaliq's uh, memoirs the league's election rallies as i recall were mostly held in the evening in the period between the two post sunset prayers of maghrib and isha it ensured good attendance people finished their day's work at the store or at the office then went home 
prayed, had dinner with the family, and then content in body and soul sallied forth again for a nice time with other men. Barabanki then had any number of open spaces that could accommodate crowds and the most sought after was our open air grain market. It was right in the heart of the city and the clock tower that commemorated the jubilee of India's Caesar provided it with an imposing backdrop. Less than a mile from our house, it was close enough for me to get to after grabbing some food in the kitchen, but I don't think I ever attended any rally to its very end. I was still sleeping in the ladies' section of the house where the back door was locked early, and so sad to tell as the main speaker was warming up to his subject, I was usually running home to avoid a scolding. In any case, the first hour or so was always more fun. People slowly trickled in, and those who mattered much in their own opinion took up positions in front of the surrounding shops now closed for the night. There they found something to sit on, a bench, a ledge, or a cot brought down from the owner's residence upstairs. Only the humble and the meek, or the glamour boys seeking to be close to the ladies' section, happily chose to sit on the dusty dharis spread before the speaker's platform. Before the leaders arrived, suitably late, the mic and the platform were always available to the many budding poets and orators of Barabanki. No doubt a few received a little money for their pains, but for most, the brief spell in limelight, despite the barbs and insults it brought them, was a heady and sufficient reward. The so-called better poets came from Lucknow and other places, and they came to the mic after the leaders had arrived. Of them, the most popular in Barabanki was a young poet named Dil Lucknavi. Whatever Dil lacked as a poet, and lack he did much, <laughs> he more than made up for it in his recitation. What a powerful voice he had. He could clearly be heard from far away even when the mic failed. And with the mic working, his tarannum, his melody, resounded in the sky above the city and alerted everyone but the heaviest sleepers to the league's virtues and promises. Tall and fair, dressed in a black sherwani and a jinnah cap, Dil was a hit with everyone, particularly with some in the curtain area. As a volunteer in that section, I had to get his autograph for many an ecstatic girl. <laughs> his verses were awful, but no one cared. We just gaped as this enormous sound came out of his mouth and then swayed involuntarily to the rhythm of his tarannum. You should be thankful that only two of his verses are still nailed to my memory. <laughs> here and here they are. <laughs> ये उम्मत की कश्ती जिना के सहारे चली जा रही है किनारे किनारे <laughs> The community's boat with Jinnah's support merrily goes from shore to shore <laughs> The second masterpiece went as follows Jinnah par hasaya Muhammad Ali ka karam par karam be hisab aa raha hai Jinnah stands in Muhammad's shade and Ali's too as God bestows his favor on him manifold. Now there must have been similar poet esters at the Congress rallies, but I never went to any Congress rally. It could have cost me my membership in the MSF. To balance the record, I can only quote from a Congress poet, Shamim Kirhani, whose name I had seen in magazines even then. I looked up some of his topical verses in an anthology of nationalist Urdu poetry published in India. They are better than Dil's, but only a share or two. Here are some lines from one of his denunciations of the Muslim League. Hamko batlao to kya matlab hai Pakistan ka? Jis jagha is waqt hai Muslim, najis hai kya wo ja? 
نیش تہمت سے تیرے چشتی کا سینا چاک ہے چل بتلا کیا زمین اجمیر کی ناپاک ہے ہیں اماموں کے جو روزے لکھنؤ کی خاک پر بن گئے کیا توبہ توبہ خطے ناپاک پر آہ اس پاکیزہ گنگا کو نجس کہتا ہے تو جس کے پانی سے کیا مسلم شہیدوں نے وضو کیا یہ مطلب ہے کہ ہم محروم آزادی رہیں منقسم ہو کر عرب کی طرح فریادی رہیں ٹیل می واٹ ڈز پاکستان مین از دس لینڈ ویئر وی مسلم آر اینی لیس پیور یور سلر ہیز وونڈ اے چشتیز بریسٹ کوئک ٹیل می از اجمیر ایم پیور اینڈ لکھنؤ شرائنس ٹو دا ہولی امامس ڈو دے اسٹینڈ گاڈ فار بڈ آن ان کلین لینڈ یو کال دا گینگز ان کلین بٹ اس واٹرز ونس were used by Muslim martyrs to cleanse themselves. You wish us to remain devoid of freedom, cut up like the Arabs, forever a victim. Poetry, particularly bad poetry, is of course more memorable than prose. That's why I could share with you Dil's verses. But I have no memory of the speeches I enthusiastically applauded that winter. Doubtless, they were heartwarming and mind-boggling, as political oratory always is. Uh, instead, I shall quote briefly, though not improperly, I hope, from the state statement issued in October 1945 by the president of the MSF, Raja Amir Ahmad Khan of Mahmudabad. Though Mahmudabad was in another district, the Raja had extensive properties in Barabanki. Consequently, he was also a highly respected person of our Jawar. In his statement, he exhorted the boys of the MSF to suspend every activity and work hard only for the good cause. I quote, Today the road of our duty is clearer and more open than in the past. Next month it shall be decided if the Indian Muslims can live in India as Muslims and as members of the World Islamic Brotherhood, or will they be forced to live under a culture that is totally opposite of Islam? The world watches us to see if the Muslim nation utilizes this God-gifted moment and declares that Pakistan was its birthright and must be obtained no matter how. Every Muslim, young or old, faces his duty in this time of elections. Any hardship is to be tolerated, considering how precious and important the results will be. Muslim youth is about to have a most valuable experience in practical politics. Compared to it, the cost of their time is insignificant. The experiences that our youth will now have will be of utmost value to them later, when in the future, the burden of administering the country will be placed on their shoulders. They will fruitfully draw upon the precious experience they will gain now. My brother knows, my brother Mateen knows only the very urban Urdu. <coughs> he never spoke Avadi or even what we call the Kachi Boli when he was growing up in Barabanki. But he had been sent to do this campaigning. And so when we spoke recently, I asked him a question. I said, look, you couldn't have understood the language of those villagers in Gorakhpur. And they couldn't have understood everything that you said. So what did you do? I talked of the Quran and the Prophet, he said. And then, of course, he laughed. Lately, I've been reading a lot of memoirs, one of them by Qazi Jalil Abbasi of Basti, a well-known congressite from my part of the world, though not from my Jawar. It contains some anecdotes from the 46th campaign that resonated, that resonated with me, more so after my conversation with Mateen. Abbasi introduces his anecdotes with a truism that most Muslims use when they feel unwantedly sheepish. Musalman fitratan jazbati hota hai. He begins, Muslims are by nature emotional. You can understand what will follow after that beginning. 
So Muslims are by nature emotional. Then he goes on, at one place, I am quoting now, at one place as I campaigned on behalf of my brother, I showed my Muslim audience a picture of Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah and explained to them that Jinnah Sahab had no beard, that he lived like an Englishman and cared little for Namaz Rosa. Further, that his wife was Parsi. Of course, poor Rati had been dead for 17 years by then. But Then I showed them a picture of Maulana Abul Kalam Azad and tried to convince them that the Maulana was a religious scholar held in high regard by religious scholars all over India. I also said that in Calcutta, where lakhs of Muslims came together to pray at the Maidan on the two Eids, it was the Maulana who led the prayers. Immediately a man stood up and shouted, Sir, why must you tell us these lies? Why must you cast slurs on Maulana Jinnah Sahib when I have myself prayed where he was the Imam? It is it's not a picture of Jinnah Sahib that you are showing us. It's a picture of Mr. Abul Kalam Azad. You should repent, sir, repent. The crowd burst into applaud, applaud and I was left blankly staring at the man. The second anecdote resonated with my memory even more. Abbasi writes, I quote, it was my habit to draw a map of India on the wall and then explain to my audience that no matter what happened, UP was going to remain in India. I would say to them, even Jinnah Sahib is not deceiving us. He openly says that the Muslims of UP will have to bear domination by the Hindus, that they will have to, uh, that they will have to sacrifice themselves for the sake of their Muslim brother elsewhere. On one occasion, a man got up and said, Sir, must you show us the weakness of your own faith? Tell me, how many Muslims were there at the battles of Uhud and Badr? A righteous battle is always fought trusting only God. With one shout of Allah Akbar, we shall be in Delhi. Then with another shout of Allah Akbar, we shall reach Lucknow. Sir, you should keep your faith strong. UP too will be a part of Pakistan. And a huge shout of Allah Akbar went up from the crowd. Not surprisingly, while Jalil Abbasi and his brother Adil were Congress stalwarts, their other brother and a brother-in-law were passionate supporters of the Muslim League. But they had nothing personal against us, Jalil writes. They honestly believed that Pakistan will be a boon to, honest, to Indian Muslims. Their stand was, let Pakistan be formed now. We shall take care of our own issues later. And so it was that when the final tally was announced that January night, when half the city seemed to have gathered in the Kacheri and even I had risked, even I had risked to stay out way after 10, Jamil Mia of Baragao had received only 4,390 votes, while Jamal Mia of Frangi Mahal had garnered 10,006. 67 percent of all eligible Muslim voters in the constituency had exercised their restricted franchise. Very big turnout. Let us skip forward again from January 1946 to June, to June 1947, to be precise, to June 3. Scene 3. I can close my eyes and see the scene in our inside courtyard that evening. A cousin from Gonda who had an electric goods shop there had stopped for the night on his way back from Lucknow. Among his purchases was a magnificent portable radio, nothing less than the famous transoceanic made here in Chicago by Zenith. Barabanki then didn't have electricity and my father was not interested in radios and so he was not a part of us who clustered around the radio as my cousin fiddled with its knobs. The thickening light and the gritty air of that hot June dusk are still palpable for me. Finally, the mighty men of the time began to speak 
one after another. I doubt if anyone listened to the first two, for it was a third man whom we wanted to hear so keenly, almost achingly. A deeper hush fell over us when he spoke. Did we understand everything he said? Did it matter what he said? Did anything matter except hearing that surprisingly deep voice coming out of the man who looked so frail in his pictures? He ended his remarks with the two words I had shouted a thousand times in the preceding months. Pakistan, Zindabad, long live Pakistan. We looked triumphantly at each other, though I also felt a little surprised. It was the way he had said the two familiar words, almost like an Englishman, with clipped vowels and hard T's and D's. But I would be a damn liar if I tell you now that my eyes weren't moist like everyone else's. That the same eyes, only eight months later, fluttered over for a different though painfully re related reason is of course another story and I have already told it elsewhere. Thank you. <laughs>